Please be seated. Yesterday, I was in Philadelphia for the consecration of their new bishop. And the way those things normally go is all of the bishops have to get there a couple of hours early, which means we're early on that Saturday morning and there's coffee and we sit around and chat and usually bring each other up to speed on things that are going on. And the presiding bishop, Michael Curry, asked me if I would share something of what had been going on in the aftermath of the Pulse shooting that had recently happened in Orlando. So I talked about that at some length, about some of the efforts that we were making and the things that had been happening. And other people shared, of course, reactions to other places where there had been acts of violence around the country. And Michael Curry, our presiding bishop, then quoted a very famous preacher of the mid-20th century by the name of Harry Emerson Fosdick. Harry Emerson Fosdick was, during World War II, the pastor of a very, very large church. We'd call it a megachurch now. Uh, A Protestant, non-denominational congregation called Riverside Church in New York City. And he, during that time, had many, many families that had lost relatives to the war. And there was a time where it was particularly poignant, where people could feel the uncertainty and the fear and the grief that surrounds those kinds of untimely deaths. And he got up in the pulpit, and his opening line was, religion dry as dust will never do. Religion dry as dust will never do. Uh, It hit me. I wrote it down. Because it seems to me that at these times when we go through times of fear and uncertainty and things are difficult, the last thing that we need is dry as dust religion, pious platitudes, weary liturgy and hymns, and a kind of pro forma that gives us the capacity to sort of do what needs to be done in public but doesn't in fact actually answer the cries of the heart. And so I began to wrestle with that. And then when I looked at the scriptures, I saw that there really were within the context of the scriptures given, especially the epistle lesson in Colossians and the gospel lesson, in essence, a a prescription, a prescription for a religion that is anything but dry and dust, as dust, but instead a religion that is rich, full, and vibrant, and has real meaning. That's actually what's going on in this Mary Martha story. There have been preachers who take that story, and they sort of give the obvious, um, what's the response, what is the thing that it's teaching us, which is basically mean work less and pray more. And I think that is superficial in the extreme, and doesn't actually get at the heart of either what's going on in Martha or what Jesus is trying to address. You know the story, if you've had any church experience at all. Mary's breaking all the rules. Typically what would happen when the rabbi would gather is that they would all sit in the front room, all meaning the men. And then Mary and any women present would make sure that the meal was being prepared while the men discussed the things that the rabbi brought to them, and then at the time appointed, the meal would be served. Mary, you see, isn't doing anything of that like that. She wants to hear Jesus. And so she comes in and she takes, in fact, a place among the men and begins to sit and listen to him. Martha is outraged. But she's not just outraged because Mary has broken social convention. It's a lot more personal. And what she says very clearly, and I'm sure in a decidedly angry tone, Jesus, why don't you tell Mary to come in and help me out? I'm in here all by myself. Notice what Jesus says. Jesus is always, if you notice in the scriptures, hesitant to, in essence, choose one side over the other. And the reason is, is because no, nobody's true blue in most of these arguments. All of us have a certain taintedness that brings us into these sorts of situations. But what Jesus does is that in a very perceptive way, 
he actually speaks to what's going on in Martha's heart that is far larger than the immediate circumstance of her, in essence, being in the kitchen all by herself and mad at Mary for putting her in that position. That's a part of what you see begins to happen. He says, Martha, you are distracted by many things. What he's actually doing is describing her life. He's not just talking about this particular instance. He's talking about a certain kind of person. A certain kind of person who is in her or his deep heart overworked, anxious, and more often than not, in the midst of a series of all these demanding circumstances, is feeling what? Feeling alone. Nobody feels what I feel. Nobody sees all the sacrifices that I make. Nobody really appreciates everything that I'm doing. And besides, it's their fault, because if people did their responsibilities, I wouldn't have to pick up the slack. That's what she's really saying, you see, to Jesus. If she was doing her part, I wouldn't be here by myself. She's a, she's a rule follower. This is, remember, the same Martha who showed up after Lazarus had died and was like almost in his face. If you had been here, like it's really your fault that Lazarus is dead. You know people like that? I do. Actually, I think there's a little bit of both Mary and Martha inside of all of us. The point that Jesus is trying to make, though, is in the term distraction. You see, if there is inside of us, usually a person who has that kind of, lives in that kind of world is also a person who has known deep disappointments. Things have not worked out the way that they planned. They've been hurt. And sometimes they've been hurt profoundly. And when you have things that don't work out the way you want, when you've been hurt, and especially if you've been struck by tragedy, there's a kind of inner heaviness about you. And it's deep within, on the inside. And you don't like it. You don't like that part of yourself at all. And therefore, you think the way to answer that kind of inner heaviness to deal with that kind of disappointment and that kind of distraction is to distract yourself from all the stuff that's going on inside. Usually a person who's a charger like this, somebody who keeps the rules and expects other people to do the same and feels just additional burdens when they don't do what they're supposed to do, so I have to do it for them. Thank you very much again is because there's that kind of pain inside from which they are trying to escape through all of that kind of work. Martha, 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 you are distracted by many things. You see, when you have that kind of feeling inside, a part of what happens to you is that you're in fact trying to manage chaos. Chaos within, as well as chaos out there. Chaos meaning these circumstances are bigger than me and I cannot and don't know how to control them. And for that kind of person, if you can't control it, it feels like chaos. Which is why Jesus says there's only one thing needful. What is he talking about? What is the one thing needful in the midst of someone who's wrestling with that kind of profound inner grief and conflict? It's being with him who, and here's the key line in that Colossian reading, who holds all things together. That's one of the descriptions of Jesus in the Colossian passage. You see, because if there's chaos and it's more than you can handle and things are not working out that you want and you clearly don't feel in control of your circumstances, but you're trying to do the best you can with what you have, but you resent like crazy that you're in that sort of situation, nobody's holding it together. 
That's what you feel. And therefore, you have to step in and somehow to take control of things in a way that often feels coercive, both to other people as well as to you. Because you're trying to manage a level of -of out-of-controlness that is more than you can handle. But to be with Jesus, who holds all things together, begins to produce in us a different kind of inner life. You see, it's not that you figure it out. That's not it. That's, again, a part of the control stuff. If I get the best facts possible, then maybe that'll help me manage all of the stuff that's going on in my life. And while, sure, ignorance of the facts produces a certain kind of fear, it still doesn't get at the heart of the matter, which is this effort to somehow manage all of this because I don't like what's going on inside as well as what's going on out there. But if I can go and be with him, meaning Jesus, and and pour out before him everything that is in my heart. All of the anger, all of the resentments, all of the fears, all of the grief, all of the sense of loss. And if in the midst of that I can affirm, okay, God, I don't, don't understand. I don't even know how to sometimes even get through the day. But if you are the one who holds all things together, and if you really are here and here, because the other key line in Colossians is Christ in you. Even though I don't often feel your presence in me at all, right? Nod your head then, Lord, I'm willing to take a step in the day, into this day, as nothing less than a sheer act of trust. I can't predict what's going to happen. And I don't like it when I snip at people because I'm so frustrated. I know it's not right, God. I'm sorry. I need to learn how to trust in you who holds all things together. I need to see the fact that you really are in here and that I'm not alone, which is what I feel. And that you would be the one to somehow take me and guide me and save me from the worst parts of myself and help me to make sense out of these days ahead and to give me the comfort that I need, especially when I don't understand. Give me, and this is where it takes us back even to the collect. Give me, God, the things that I cannot ask for the sake of my blindness, but I need so desperately. Martha, Martha, there is only one thing needful. And what is that one thing? It's not a, it's not a thing, it's actually a who. It's him who is literally saying that comment. I mean, the one who holds heaven and earth and is in her living room, you see. That it it is in fact to, to somehow be with him that helps provide that kind of inner order that I can't get any other way. You see, one thing, there's no plan B. So long as I continue to try to manage and figure it out and wrestle, even though sometimes, you know, we can't help ourselves but do that, right? Even though we know that it's futile and might even be more frustrating. But if I can continue to keep going to God and saying, okay, God, exhale, I belong to you. You're in here. And you're the one that holds all things together. Help me continue to get into this day with you. God, in fact, will give us the very things even for which our blindness we cannot ask. Because that's who he is. Notice what he doesn't do to Martha. He doesn't say, Martha, if you just get it together, this would be a lot easier for all of us. 
You see, that's another coercive, demanding person talking. Jesus is not like that. He speaks in the gentlest of tongues to a woman who's full of all kinds of frustration and anger and sorrow. And the same is true for us. You see, if you think that Jesus is wagging his finger at you and saying, come on, get it together, I think you're just looking at an image of yourself. You're not looking at Jesus at all. Jesus doesn't treat people that way. He invites us into something that's far more tender, far more human, as well as divine. So today, in the midst of all of the things that you are going through, and I don't know what's in your heart, you don't know what's in mine, can we say today, even as we receive the Eucharist, even as we pray together, God, here's who I am. All I can do is be me and offer myself to you. Help me know more and more of you, the one who holds all things together and even when I don't feel it, is alive and alive in me because I'm your child and you love me and you will never let me go. Amen.